It's kind of a coincidence that we're at Gander Mountain because some of my research recently, sure, please Jim, has revealed that Gander Mountain is, the CEO of Gander Mountain is a strong free market advocate. Maybe both sides. Well, okay, please ask them. No, no, that doesn't matter. Just, just put the other switch. Yeah. Um. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but. In, in trying to decide what to talk about today, I decided to focus on something called tax increment financing. Does anybody here know what tax increment financing is? Nobody? One person knows. Okay. Um, <clears throat> tax increment financing is what cities use to, to do what they call urban renewal. But it's the way they finance eminent domain. Now this is Suzette Kilo and her house in uh, New London, Connecticut before it was moved and her lot taken from her by eminent domain with compensation, but she fought it to the Supreme Court. Uh, a lot of the people who have been fighting eminent domain don't realize that without tax increment financing, there wouldn't be much eminent domain going on because cities wouldn't have any money to finance that eminent domain. So, how, what does tax increment financing do and how does it work? The first thing that happens is a city will draw a line around a neighborhood and call it variously the urban renewal district, urban redevelopment district, tax increment district. This happens to be the Arapahoe neighborhood in Denver and the city of Denver has decided that it is blighted. And since it is blighted, they have drawn this line around it, and they're going to spend your tax dollars, perhaps taking some properties by eminent domain, scraping them, and then selling it to a bulldozer at far less than what it costs the taxpayers. Selling it to a bulldozer? Selling it to a developer for far less than what it costs the taxpayers uh, to uh, uh, redevelop. And the goal for the city is to produce more tax revenues. The goal for uh, the developers is to do some development without a lot of risk. If the city is giving them a bunch of money and they're giving them cheap land, there's low risk to do the development. Now in Colorado, you can only do urban renewal if it's blighted. Unfortunately, cities have decided to have very loose definitions of blighted. This, for example, is a shopping mall in St. Louis that they declared was blighted so that they could use tax dollars to essentially redevelop the shopping mall. And the shopping mall owner was perfectly happy to let them redevelop it at taxpayers' expense because the shopping mall owner benefited. In that case, there wasn't any eminent domain. The state of Wisconsin decided that some farmers' cornfields were blighted and uh, they wanted to take the land by eminent domain and not redevelop it, but develop it into some urban development. And uh, they felt like the only way they could do it was uh, by calling it blighted. The state of California, or some cities in the state of California, has declared parts of the Mojave Desert to be blighted and have taken that by eminent domain using tax increment financing <coughs> and redeveloped it or developed it. Now, the advocates of tax increment financing say that it doesn't cost anybody anything because what happens is you draw that line and then you freeze the property taxes at the current level, which might be, say, $10 million a year, and those property taxes, of course, go to fire and schools and police and things like that. And then from then on, all increases in property taxes, when I say you freeze the taxes, you don't freeze the taxes that people pay, you freeze the taxes that are going to be collected by the fire department, the school district, and the other entities that are collecting those taxes. From then on, for anywhere up to 50 years in Colorado, it says 23 years on this example, but anywhere up to 50 years, all of the increase in tax revenue from that neighborhood goes to the city to subsidize urban renewal. And often what they'll do is they'll estimate that we're going to get, say, $50 million in taxes after the area is redeveloped instead of the $10 million we're getting today. So the difference is $40 million. They will amortize that out for however many years they want. 
uh, and as I say, in Colorado, it can be as long as 50 years, and then sell bonds that will be repaid by that tax increment. And then they'll take the bonds, the, the revenue from the bonds, condemn people's land, scrape it, maybe do some of the redevelopment themselves, put in new streets, new sewers, new water, parking garages, all kinds of infrastructure for the developers, and then essentially give it to a developer or sell it for uh, some very low price. And in Portland, Oregon, uh, they, the city and the developer agreed that they would hire an outside appraiser to determine how much a property was worth that the city had bought for $5 million, a downtown Portland property. And uh, the outside appraiser who was selected by the developer decided the property was worth negative $3 million. So the city is supposed to pay the developer to take $3 million, take the $3 million to take the property off their hands. Now, after the bonds are paid off, in however many years that is, then the revenue can start going back to the uh, schools, the fire, the police, and so on. And so we have this post-TIF tax revenue that looks like, oh, we're going to get all this revenue that we wouldn't have gotten before because we have this new redevelopment. We have higher value developments. Of course, that's 30, 40, 50 years in the future. By that time, those developments might be slums themselves, might be blighted themselves, uh, especially if you put in a development that really wasn't that popular. The other problem is that the cost of providing schools, fire, and police is not frozen. The costs continue to go up, both because of inflation, but also because if you put a new development in, if it's got residences, they're going to have children who are going to go to schools. If it has commercial and office and retail, they're going to need fire and police protection. And so the cost of providing those services are going to go up, and yet the revenues are frozen, which means people in the rest of the city are going to either have to pay more taxes to subsidize this area, or they're going to have to accept a lower level of urban services because the fire department, the school district, and so on is going to have to serve both the areas that are providing them with tax revenues and the areas that aren't. So their TIF money is not free money, even though the planners will tell, tell you over and over again that TIF money is free money and you should feel free to let them take as much TIF as they want uh, and not worry about what it's going to do to your taxes. Now, what, what kind of things get TIF money? The Adams Mark Hotel in downtown Denver received $33 million in TIF money. Now, if you're a hotel builder and you find out that a competitor just built a hotel with $33 million in TIF money, you're not going to want to build a hotel yourself unless you get $33 million in TIF money, which means uh, you end up creating what economists call a moral hazard in that uh, you're putting people in a quandary that they're not going to be able to do something unless they themselves are willing to uh, beg for this kind of money. Denver Pavilions along the 16th Street, 16th, uh, Street Mall, Bus Mall, received $32 million in TIF. The Pepsi Center received $36 million in TIF. Uh, shopping malls in Westminster called uh, the Shops at Walnut Creek and Mandalay Gardens together received $40 million in TIF. And right here in Thornton, something called the North Washington Corridor. And I don't know exactly what that is. This is a picture of North Washington. Uh, something called the North Washington Corridor received $37 million in TIF money. Now, the advocates of TIF say that TIF promotes economic development and urban growth. And so a lot of economists have looked at this, and a couple of economists from Illinois uh, looked at it. What is the influence of TIF on economic development? And they found that cities that use TIF actually grow slower than cities that don't. Well, why would that be? A couple of reasons. First of all, when you use TIF, you're putting a tax burden on everybody else. So with that increased tax burden, businesses are going to say, we're going to go to a city that has a lower tax burden. Second of all, it's this case of moral hazard. Uh, this is a 
hotel that was built in uh, entirely with TIF money in uh, Wichita, Kansas. And uh, since they built that hotel, every hotel in Wichita that's ever that's been built has received TIF money. And um, nobody will build a hotel without it. So you end up let with less development unless you're willing to spend more and more on TIF, which means you're eating into your tax base with each new development. Plus, you are eating into the tax base of the other agencies that are funded by tax dollars. Uh, the North Metro Fire Department actually had a measure on the ballot to increase property taxes for them. And they said there were several reasons why they needed the increase, but the majority of the increase was needed to compensate for TIF money that had been taken from them because of developments, uh, TIF developments in its district. So if you hadn't had TIF, you wouldn't have had to vote in that election to whether to increase the tax base for the fire district. Which means when you were voting, you were actually voting for TIF, but you didn't know it. You thought you were voting for fire protection. Now, there are some companies that specialize in getting TIF. In fact, they seem to be more interested in getting TIF than they actually are interested in doing whatever is their main job. Bass Pro, for example, the nation's second largest sporting goods chain, in Mesa, Arizona, got $84 million in TIF for this uh, store. Uh, somebody did an analysis and found uh, more than half a billion dollars in subsidies to Bass Pro from TIF in cities across the nation. So Bass Pro comes to your city and says, are you going to give me a TIF subsidy? I want 30 to $40 million, and if you do, I'll build this giant destination uh, uh, sporting goods store, and if you don't, I'll go somewhere else. Cabela's, the nation's first largest sporting goods chain, uh, got $40 million in TIF subsidies for this uh, sporting goods store in uh, Fort Worth. And again, uh, I don't have a total, but from the numbers I've seen, I suspect Cabela's has also received more than half a billion dollars in TIF subsidies for stores across the country. The CEO of Gander Mountain is a man named Mark Baker. As I said, uh, he's free market oriented. He refuses to take TIF subsidies. He lobbies against TIF subsidies. He says, if you give Gander Mountain a TIF subsidy, you're going to be hurting businesses in your own community. If I can't compete against them without a subsidy, I shouldn't be competing against them at all. So Gander Mountain is the nation's third largest sporting goods store, and they... Uh, I'll refuse to take the subsidy. Now, occasionally they'll lease a building that was built with a TIF subsidy, but unlike Bass Pro and Cabela's, they don't say, we're going to build this building if you give us a subsidy. Now, I recently wrote a paper on this subject called Crony Capitalism and Social Engineering. And I'd like to talk a little bit about I mean, the Bass Pro and the Cabela is a sort of crony capitalism, but I'd like to talk about each of those a little bit. Uh, starting with the light rail here in, in Denver. Oh, excuse me, that's not Denver. Whenever I see an orange and white light rail train in front of an ugly, subsidized, government subsidized building, I think it's Denver. But in fact, <laughs> here it is. This is a light rail in Denver. That other one was in Moscow, Russia, by the way. <laughs> now, I don't want to say nobody rides the light rail in Denver, but Denver actually has the emptiest light rail trains of any post-war light rail system in America. Uh, the average Denver light rail train car has 15.8 riders on it. Now, of course, in rush hour it's got more, at other times of the day it's got less, but over the course of the day it's an average of 15.8. San Jose, which is another disastrous uh, light rail system has 16.8, Minneapolis has almost 25, Houston has 30, and Phoenix has 34 and a half. Phoenix has more than twice as many passengers on its light rail train than Denver. And Denver claims theirs is a success. Are there lower than Denver? The only one that's lower is, is Pittsburgh, but that was a pre-war system. So among post-war systems, there are none lower than Denver. Now, the New York Times a couple of years ago had an article about how light rail spurs urban redevelopment. And they gave three <coughs> examples. 
One was in Dallas, Texas. It was actually a sub uh, suburb of Dallas called Carrollton. And whenever I hear that light rail spurred urban redevelopment, I always Google the name of the development and the word TIF, T-I-F, and almost always I find that it receives subsidies. In this particular case, there's a light rail station just outside of this picture. This shopping area and, and residential area received $13 million in subsidies for a $38 million develop, dollar development. Notice on the left a giant parking garage. If light rail was spurring the development, why do they need a parking garage? Obviously, because really nobody's going to go to that shopping mall on light rail, or very few people. Um, and most people are going to take the cars. The second example given by the New York Times was, incredibly enough, a development in Columbus, Ohio, that it turned out received $800 million in TIF subsidies and doesn't have a rail line today or any one rail line plan. In fact, Columbus has no plans to ever build a rail transit line. And yet it was in the article about how rail transit spurs economic development. The third example, the third and final example in the New York Times was Stapleton here in Denver. The Stapleton Air, uh, Airport that was converted into a big housing development. And unlike the one in Columbus, it does have a rail line planned to it, but that rail line is not going to get there for at least 10 years after the development was put in place. And it received a whopping $294 million in TIF subsidies. To domestic oil. Well, that's where the social engineering comes in. Because at the time Stapleton was being built, Denver was in the middle of a housing boom. Remember the housing bubble? Uh, Denver had the most expensive housing in the state, in the country, in a state that didn't, wasn't on an ocean. Um, so there was a big housing boom. Stapleton Airport was basically a big flat area. We could have the city could have given it to developers, they could have sold it to developers, and they would have been glad to put in single-family homes, which is what, what Americans want to live in. But no, planners decided that it would be better for a high percentage of people to live in multifamily housing. So the subsidies were to get developers to put in kinds of housing that people really don't want to live in. And that really is what the big TIF is about here in the Denver area today uh, is subsidizing high density developments along the current under construction and planned rail lines. They call them transit oriented developments. And the idea is that since this is going to be next to a train station, people won't need to drive as much, and so that'll be better for the environment. It doesn't really matter that. The light rail line is powered by coal, which actually produces more pollution than the cars that people drive. Uh, what matters is getting people to live in places like this. Now notice there's a big parking lot there, uh, because it turns out that if you didn't have a lot of parking for people, they wouldn't live there, and the development would have high vacancy rates. Lowry Air Base received $35 million in TIF, so they would put in uh, row houses like this instead of just detached single-family homes. Arvada, $45 million in TIF. Arista, $62 million in TIF. Lakewood took an old shopping mall, I forget what it was called, and turned it into a new shopping mall called Belmar that includes housing on the second, third, and fourth stories of some of these buildings, uh, and then the rest of its ground-level shops, almost $100 million in TIF. And then, of course, Stapleton, $100 million, $300 million. So that's the social engineering. The whole idea is that planners think you shouldn't live in a single-family home, you shouldn't drive, you should ride around in transit, you should live in multi-family housing. So we're going to draw an urban growth boundary around Denver. That's going to make the single-family homes more expensive. We're going to subsidize the multi-family housing so that we'll change the percentage of people who are living in single-family homes from historic level of about 66 to 70 percent to what their goal is, which is about 55 percent. And it would, their goal would be even lower if they thought they could do more. Now the crony capitalism comes in because 
you're passing out millions of dollars to developers, and so the city has very quickly realized that there's a lot of political power in doing this. Now, this is Chicago, which is kind of the, uh, the king of crony capitalism in the, in the United States. These are some of the TIF developments in Chicago. And uh, the Chicago's previous mayor, Richard Daly, uh, it was said that he used TIF as his personal slush fund to reward uh, not only people who contributed to his campaigns, but to reward uh, other aldermen on the city council who were supporting his policies and punish the ones who weren't. This is a map showing how much each ward is getting in TIF money, the darker uh, ones receive more than the lighter ones. If you voted against daily too often, you would be in a lighter ward. And supposedly, TIF was originally created in Illinois to help lighted neighborhoods. Uh, the first mayor in, in Chicago to use it was Harold Washington, who was the, Chicago's first black mayor, and he used it to help lighted African-American neighborhoods. But look where most of the money is going now. It's going right to downtown Chicago, which is a fairly wealthy area. It is taking so much money away from schools that school teachers have actually marched in protest against TIF. Here's an opportunity for the Tea Party to form some coalitions with some groups that you might consider to be uh, have irreconcilable differences with you. They marched into a, uh, a car dealer that had received a half million dollars in TIF money and demanded their half million dollars back. Uh, a few of them got arrested, but of course that was the whole point. Now, Chicago has a new mayor named Rahm Emanuel, and he's a great fiscal conservative, of course. <laughs> and so uh, he has said that he's going to change how TIF is done. He's not quite willing to throw it out completely, which is what some of the aldermen want to do, but he's, want, he's willing to make some changes. Now, my hometown of Portland was a good example of both crony capitalism and social engineering. And I think there's probably some of both here in Denver, too, but I only know about the social engineering part. Now, this guy was uh, Neil Goldschmidt. He was mayor of Portland. Uh, he, he planned the first light rail line in Portland. He, Jimmy Carter thought that was a neat idea, so he made him secretary of transportation. Then he came back to Oregon, became governor. As governor, he appointed this man, a friend of his, uh, who was an uh, urban developer. He appointed him to be general manager of the region's transit agency. And so uh, the region's transit agency got federal dollars to hand out to urban developers to build transit-oriented developments, and almost every single one of them was built by his personal construction company. His name was Tom Walsh. Walsh Construction was his company, but of course, he didn't run the company. His brother was running the company. He was running the transit agency, giving his brother the millions of dollars of subsidies. Uh, this happy-looking fellow uh, is another developer. He hired Neil Goldsmith to funnel a bunch of subsidies to him, so he got all kinds of subsidies to put in mid-rise and high-rise developments in Portland, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies. And the current mayor of Portland has said that he does not want to see a single, uh, one more single family home ever built in Portland. He wants all new residents of Portland, and they're expecting 300,000 new residents in the next 40 years, to live in high-rise or mid-rise developments along one of the rail lines so they won't drive as much. Now, here's a real good example of a TIF development enhancing real estate values so that it would increase tax revenues and pay for itself. This is what's known as a wet homeless shelter. Anybody know what a wet homeless shelter is? A wet homeless shelter is one where you can use drugs and drink alcohol to your heart's content and just die right on the premises. They're not going to try to censor what you do while you're there. And this wet homeless shelter is in an area that is had all kinds of redevelopment, all of which has been subsidized by TIF. And you have to wonder, you know, is the wet homeless shelter enhancing the property value so they're getting more taxes to be able to pay the about $29 million they spent to subsidize it? I kind of doubt it. Now, Neil Goldschmidt uh, 
was considered the most powerful man in Oregon. He had uh, connections at the federal, state, and local level. He could wave his hand and build an aerial tramway or a light rail line wherever he wanted and give all kinds of money to developers. And then in 2004, in a Pulitzer Prize winning article in one of Portland's papers, uh, it was revealed that when he had been a 35-year-old mayor of Portland in the 1970s, he had an affair with a 13-year-old girl next door that lasted three years and ruined her life. She ended up, she died of uh, drug-related diseases about a year ago. And then and only then did the newspapers start revealing that Portland was run by what the reporters said they had privately called the Light Rail Mafia. And the Light Rail Mafia consisted of the Godfather, Neil Goldschmidt, and all kinds of developers and city officials and you know people funneling money to the developers and getting campaign contributions back and so on and so forth. So what I tell people is if you start getting TIF in your city, you better hope that there's a sex scandal so you can find out where all that money went. Now, TIF was actually invented in California in 1952. And as of 2010, more than half of all TIF in the country was still in California, although the percentage was shrinking. As of 1990, it was 80%. By 2010, it was uh, less than 60%. So what that means is TIF is rapidly growing in other states around the country, but it still is growing at 10% a year in California. It was costing each resident more than $150 a year. And the total cost was $5.7 billion a year, and that's 12% of all property taxes in California was going to TIF. Now, in California, as in Colorado, as in Oregon, the government cannot raise your taxes without a vote. But TIF is exempt from that. They can do all the TIF they want and effectively raise their tax revenues, the cities can, by stealing it away from schools and fire and police. And uh, then the schools and fire and police might come to you and say, we need to have an increased tax base for us. And you vote for that, but you don't vote for the TIF. The problem in California was that a lot of the schools were being funded by the state. The state was providing over half the revenue for half the expenses for schools, and the state has a $20 billion deficit in its budget and has to struggle to close that deficit every single year. So that great fiscal conservative, Jerry Moonbeam Brown, was elected governor, and the very first thing he did when he took office was he proposed to eliminate TIF in California, the state that invented it. Now, he had been mayor of Oakland, and he said, as mayor, he was just amazed at how TIF worked. It was just like magic, he said. You just wave your hand and get all the money you want. And in fact, the Los Angeles Times discovered that TIF wasn't all being used in California just for economic redevelopment. They're using it to pay city officials. And 10% of Jerry Brown's salary as mayor of Oakland was going, was coming out of TIF. So he gets elected governor and he says, let's abolish TIF. It's revolutionary. <laughs> and amazingly, the legislature, heavily dominated by Democrats, went along with it. And the vote was along party lines. Only three Republicans in the House and one Republican in the Senate voted to abolish TIF. All the rest of them voted to keep it. All the Democrats voted to abolish it. So now, California, the first state to have TIF, the state that had more than half the TIF in the country, is now one of only two states that doesn't allow TIF. Arizona is the only other state that doesn't allow TIF. And this is just shattering to the cities in California because all the cities are addicted to using TIF uh, for economic development, for getting campaign contributions, for everything else. Now there's one city that broke the addiction before 
TIF was abolished in California, and that was Anaheim. Anaheim elected a man named Kurt Pringle, who was a fiscally conservative, not really quite libertarian, but fairly fiscally conservative mayor. And he had a neighborhood in Anaheim that he wanted to redevelop. And he wanted to really turn it into downtown Anaheim. Anaheim is a new city. It didn't have a classic downtown. So he wanted to turn this triangular area here which, uh, between the highways into uh, a redeveloped area. Most of it was um, warehouses. So he said normally what a city would do is that it would write a TIF plan, <coughs> predict how much revenue they're going to get, sell a bunch of bonds, file a property, scrape it, and then sell it to developers at pennies on the dollar and uh, uh, spur the development that way. But he decided to do something completely different. Instead, what they did was they deregulated it. They said, we want economic development in this triangular area. We are going to still require you to get a building permit, but beyond that, anything goes. No zoning, no minimum density requirements, no maximum density requirements. Uh, you, you don't have to put in residential, you don't have to put in uh, offices, you can put in whatever you want. And within a very short time, they got literally $20 billion in new economic development. Hotels, apartments, offices, uh, shops, shopping malls, all kinds of stuff through deregulation rather than through TIP. Now, California's land use system is the most heavily regulated in the nation. So deregulating there means more than deregulating here in Colorado. But there's quite a few land use regulations here in Colorado, too. So deregulation here can be effective as well. Well, that's the end of my presentation on TIF. What happened? I wanted to give a plug for my book, The Best Laid Plans, uh, which talks about why government planning doesn't work. TIF is talked about in the book, along with light rail and urban growth boundaries, and lots and lots of other land use and transportation planning issues uh, that you probably have to face all the time. Uh, the book is available. Apparently we're not allowed to charge for it here. But if you make a $15 donation to the American Dream Coalition, uh, you can take a copy of the book away. Uh, I've written a paper that was recently published by Cato earlier this year called Crony Capitalism and Social Engineering. Go to Cato.org and you can find the paper and download it. Uh, a detailed analysis of TIF all across the country. Uh, a woman named Jennifer Lang worked with me. I, I, uh, she was an intern, right? And, and uh, she worked under me. And uh, I edited this paper on new urban renewal in Colorado's front range about how cities in Colorado are using TIF to socially engineer the cities into what, into what planners think they ought to be rather than what people really want. Finally, I've got a blog called The Anti-Planner. Just Google Anti-Planner and I'm the first thing on the list. And it has links to all of my papers. Uh, you can also go to ti.org, which is The Anti-Planner, Cato.org, and then this long address, americandreamcoalition.org slash land use slash land use info .html. That has links to a lot of different papers on TIF, including the paper I mentioned about uh, how TIF actually slows growth, and uh, Jennifer Lang's paper about TIF in the Colorado's front range. Um, I have an email newsletter that focuses on transportation. I send it out about once a month. If you're interested in that, you give me your email address, and I'll be glad to add you to the list. It, it doesn't deal with my news house. Are there any questions? Like? No questions? Okay. Are there other categories of things in the community that might get uh, subsidized through TIF that you didn't mention? Well, basically, they can do anything they want with TIF. Um, but it has to be a capital improvement, can't be for operating costs. And, uh, I mean, I, I showed you, they built the Pepsi Center with TIF. Uh, so they can build public buildings with TIF, they can have parks with TIF, 
they can give something to developers, have the developers build it. They can build it and then lease it to developers. They, in, in Portland, they built a streetcar line. They used a TIF to pay for part of the streetcar line. Then they used a TIF to build a parking garage. And then the uh, Whole Foods built a store next to the parking garage. And they said, oh, look, we built a streetcar line. We got a Whole Foods to move in. Well, no, they built a parking garage, and they got a Whole Foods to move in, and they just have to build a parking garage next to the streetcar line on TIF. And both the parking garage and the streetcar line were built with TIF. Could, um, uh, could uh, schools, charter schools, fall into that category? Um, in Portland, they are using TIF money to build a school, a, a public school, not a charter school. Um, but yeah, if you want TIF money, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. To get hooked on TIF money, if you want TIF money to go to charter school, technically it's feasible to do that. You can't use it for operating costs, just for capital costs. The you rules are Aurora, right? They're doing a Gaylord project. Yeah, Gaylord project. That's all it is. Yeah, that's, yeah that, that's a huge TIF project. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but $300 million in TIF plus $300 million in state money and uh, and why does a developer need any other money? I have six hundred million dollars. Uh, it's just a big boat dog. So I could possibly say that uh, Proposition 103 that we got going on here uh, now is, is possibly a result of the, the, the various tip developments. Well, I, they, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, just like the North Metro Fire District for the kids. If you can go to the, the county auditors or the assessors, county assessors, and most of the counties in Colorado have a, a statement that they publish each year that tells how much is the assessed value of all the land in the county and how much property tax revenue there is and how much of that is going to urban renewal districts. So you can go county by county and find out the dollar value and what percentage, and in, in a lot of Colorado counties, especially here in the metro area, it's around five, six percent of all property taxes are going to the TIF to urban renewal districts. And again, this is not anything anybody gets to vote on. Uh, Georgia requires an election before TIF can be created. Some people in um, uh, Estes Park got mad at the TIF going on there. So they used the initiative process to put a measure on the ballot to say that the city cannot create any new TIF districts or renew any existing TIF, TIF districts without a vote of the people. The city is fighting it in court. But that's one process that you can use in your city to try to control TIF to make sure that uh, it won't happen anymore in your city than it already has. By forcing it to a vote. By forcing it to a vote. If, if you go to voters and say, uh, will you give us uh, $50 million so we can make this developer rich? You're going to have a harder time making a case for that than if you go to voters and say, will you give us $50 million to run your schools because the developer the tip money stole the school money away. You know? That's going to be an easier case. You don't have to really admit that the TIF dollars are going to stole the school money away. Although the North Metro Fire District are very upfront about it, I'm sure the TIF districts that have stolen the money were so interesting.